worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Motadi Tabanaku Si! Welcome to the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host. Jack Lucene. As always, guys, you can find us every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time exclusively on YouTube and Spotify. This is a comedy fuel grassroots, fan-driven wrestling podcast, and we want to be the Santino Marella of wrestling podcast, king of the jobbers. So to do that, I need you guys' help. I want to hear from you. I need you guys to be my EVPs out here like the Young Bucks if you have ideas or questions for the show, please hit me up on Twitter at Jack Lucene, or if you prefer something more low key, less public, you can send me emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. And Hey, normally we always come 4 20 PM Eastern standard time, but next week is a very special WrestleMania weekend. And you know, I had to pull all the stops and so I have been chatting with the guys from Inside Squared Circle. I've been chatting with a rep from Total Apex Sports. Potentially, we will have a fatal four-way, uh, but at minimum, I'm hoping for a triple threat match. Uh, we'll be doing WrestleMania prediction previews, um, and that's going to be next Saturday, 4 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. So you can catch us right before dinner time. Go get your eat on and then catch WrestleMania weekend. So again, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday, next Saturday, April 6th, live show. So make sure you super kick that subscribe button to get notified. Today's topics, we're keeping it short and sweet. On this edition of the Worst Wrestling Podcast, uh, obviously heading into WrestleMania weekend, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm going to save my previews and predictions and that kind of stuff for that show. However, The Rock has left Cody Rhodes laying bloody, and this has opened a, uh, a door to what I was talking about on the last show, make sure you go check that out if you missed it. Um, but that I was under the assumption that basically WWE was capable of using 14, a TV rating since 2022 when it was announced and they've opted because of the image of the company, not to necessarily do that all the time. They didn't just revert back to, you know, an attitude era style of programming because that wouldn't work in today's climate anyways. But that doesn't mean that they're not able to utilize it for big stories and angles, you know, like Cody Rhodes and uh, finishing the story heading into WrestleMania. And I love all this tension that they're building through the segment. So going into the nitty gritty of what actually happened and took place on Monday Night Raw. If you haven't seen it by now, I think most people have. The Rock attacked Cody Rhodes and beat the crap out of him, took him outside in the rain and left him bloody. Uh, and there were all kinds of Easter eggs. So let's, let's parse out a little bit this segment. Let's start with the kayfabe aspect of the angle is, you know, Seth Rollins this whole time has been saying he's got Cody's back. Meanwhile, uh, Seth is getting his ass whipped by Drew uh, and therefore cannot come to Cody's aid. And so now it's like, you know, Seth Rollins proving to be more of a liability than an aid in this battle. And that's kind of, the the worms that have been planted in the mind of Cody Rhodes this whole time of whether or not he can trust Seth Rollins anyways. So you're building on that story. Cool. 
And then uh, the fact that it's The Rock who showed up as the final boss putting this beat down on Cody Rhodes. I love it for two reasons. One, you're amplifying night one and the meaning of night one. Uh, you know, Cody Rhodes getting payback on The Rock just as much as trying to win that match. And perhaps, you know, that's one aspect that they could go with of how this could cost them the match. I feel like it's locked in 100%. The Rock and Roman Reigns are winning night one. That to me is no brainer. They're going to do bloodline rules for night two because that's going to set up basically the end of this story. I do think they are hinting at and heading towards perhaps the Avengers style storyline standoff. And uh, again, getting into the Easter egg. So while The Rock is beating down Cody Rhodes outside, uh, they they show an image of one of the production trucks. And on the truck is John Cena and Stone Cold. And I've been saying on multiple episodes now that I would love to see Stone Cold Steve Austin come back at WrestleMania. Uh, especially you do it in, in the sense of, uh, you know, all is lost uh, for Cody. The bloodline is standing tall and it looks like they're about to win. And then ksh, the glass breaks. You have Austin come out, pull the save. Um, and I've heard the complaints of, oh, well, there's no story. What's the motivation? What motivation did the Texas rattlesnake ever need really when he was just wreaking havoc on Monday Night Raw? Um, he does what he wants because he does what he wants. That's kind of his shtick. So I, I think, yes, and, you know, potentially involved. I don't know really for sure who's going to be showing up at WrestleMania in that regard or 100% if they're even going to go with, like, the true Avengers standoff style story here. But however it sets up, it's exciting. It is very exciting right now to be a wrestling fan. The Rock has said it over and over in his promos. So there's that aspect of it, uh, sticking kind of with the kayfabe and the Easter eggs and what's potentially happening. But the thing I wanted to also comment on is, you know, the behind the scenes, obviously, of, uh, and, you know, Dave Meltzer continuing to die on this hill that while well, the rest of, the superstars have been kind of given a no swear order, but like the rock can do whatever he wants because he's the rock and that exists in every aspect of business and culture. And yes, to a degree that's true, but at the same time, lots of the other superstars, top superstars have been, you know, kind of pushing the envelope as of late uh, and I think it absolutely has to do with Triple H and the production crew and the kind of the style and angle that they're going with. And especially, you know, around a WrestleMania season, being able to push that envelope even a little bit further than you normally would, because I think everybody understands universally this is like their Super Bowl. So, you know, I am of the opinion that, like I said, it's a TV 14A rating, but I think they are managing how and when they use that rating, and they're doing it very effectively right now, where they can shock you with a segment like The Rock beating up Cody Rhodes and leaving him bloody, and then even if you saw, like, you are absolutely getting worked if you saw the after they went off the air stuff of The Rock and it's still filming of The Rock being like, I don't care if we went off air, it's still whipping Cody's ass. That is 1,000 million percent a work, <laughs> you know? So, like, if you're watching that and in any way you think that's shaped or molded on reality, like, I'm sorry, I got news for you. Because that's the way that they are kind of creating doubt and by creating doubt in this day and age you create kayfabe in a sense so it's really just you know uh for the really uh smart marks out there i think they're going to realize that this is just great ring psychology but again it all goes back to 
letting the performers perform. And it kind of leads it kind of leads perfectly into the next segment, which was the segment that preceded all of this uh earlier in the show, which was uh Drew McIntyre, CM Punk, and Seth Rollins in a promo standoff. And look, it wasn't I'm not saying this was like the greatest promo ever or anything. I don't feel like any one of them truly hit the mark 100%. I think they all got it 80 to 90%, which is great because somebody sometime when they hit 100%, it's going to mean that much more when it's you understand that it's coming from a place of improv. And again, this return to the days of kind of unscripted bullet point style promos that is 100% to me has to be Triple H's influence. Um, The aspect of letting the wrestlers be wrestlers. Like, obviously I love that. And traditionally that's what wrestling has always been. Um, It's not going out there and reading a script like it's reality TV. It's improv. It's athletic theater at its finest. And part of that is, again, essentially doing what I'm doing right now on this podcast. Uh, I don't have a script here. I know I keep looking this way because I can't help but look at like the image that's projected on the screen. And yes, I have my bullet points here. But as far as like a show dog, what I do is Muppet work. But essentially, that's kind of, you take that and you turn it into, you know, uh, a monologue, a promo, a podcast, whatever. Um, That's the art of doing entertainment, essentially. So uh, I really, I'm I'm so glad that they are getting further and further removed and away from kind of that late stage Vince McMahon era of the overabundance of kind of reality TV shtick that we were getting and, you know, getting more back to kind of a traditionalist uh, version of professional wrestling and sports entertainment. And it's still very much like, I think, again, what I love about Triple H's mentality is he understands, however, the other side of it of, what you're doing actually in the ring as far as like the moves and stuff is like one of the smallest parts of professional wrestling. Um, How and why and when you implement those moves and how and why and when you connect with the crowd and your promo work and all the stuff they do on the back end in terms of like the travel and the appearances and the charity work and blah, blah, blah. that is all 90% of it. And then, you know, that's the, the part of the iceberg that we don't see. And then just that little tippy top, that temperate, that's the on-screen product. So, you know, when you have all of that already in play, having to just like memorize these like stupid ass bullshit scripts like no that i think everybody could see through that and that's why the product honestly suffered for a long time and and worse uh you know triple h was doing and again when you have a guy like cm punk and seth rollins uh who you know i don't really like seth rollins as a baby face i'll be perfectly honest about that he is an exceptional heel he's honestly to me one of the best heels of all time when he is actually cast in that role um and then cm punk obviously amazing on the mic and drew mcintyre so underrated as well uh so and i've loved his his run as a heel So, again, the return to the days of unscripted bullet point style promos and letting the wrestlers perform, which is literally what you hired them to do. It's like you're just letting them do their job. Jade Cargill has finally debuted for WWE, and it was 
it was in monstrous fashion. It was uh, a storm coming, whatever you want to call it. It was fucking amazing. Uh, she looked like a million dollars. Uh, all this shit I've seen online on the IWC of like, oh, why did it take seven months? And what was, they had her, what did we learn? And but, but, but literally what I was talking about in the previous segment of the actual in ring product when you are a WWE superstar is like the tip of the iceberg. And there is a whole world of back end production and you know stage running and travel and just everything that is not comparable even to what AEW does uh that I think you know there is definitely a learning curve and beyond that obviously why would you just debut her randomly at like a limited when you could just wait and have her debut be at WrestleMania that makes way more sense. So yeah they signed her and they had her you know, I think it's great that she's been able to kind of learn more of the back end stuff, get to know people, do all of that stuff, um, get more comfortable within the company, especially with some of the people that she's going to be potentially working with. Like, I think all of that's great. So I don't I didn't see any reason to rush her debut. Uh, I'm totally fine with the fact that this is like the first time we've really seen her. The entrance was fucking awesome. Uh, and then. You know, uh, her performance, I thought, was great. Obviously, the girls uh, selling for her, and when I say girls, I should say women. I apologize. Uh, you know, Dakota Kai and uh, Io Sky and um, Kyrie Sane and Asuka, just like again, making her look like a million dollars. And uh, at the end, having her stand tall with Bianca and Naomi, I thought was fantastic. And the internet, such as it is, uh, it's so funny how, like, you can get the two completely reverse opposite perspectives back to back. And so I'm going through my feed. I'll bring it up here. I'll bring up the picture. Mr. Uncle Howdy here. Uh, are we finally noticing a theme here, or is it still somehow not obvious yet? This is being hella lazy. Uh, isn't even the worst part about it. Oh, this being hella lazy isn't even the worst part about it. Sorry. And then again, it's like, okay, fine. That's your perspective. And then literally, the person right after, representation is so important. The impact that the visual of seeing Bianca, Naomi, and Jay together in the ring as the final segment for SmackDown is unprecedented. Moments like this is transformative for young people like my students in TWC. I can't wait to show them. And that's the one that I really want to highlight because too often, uh, you know, we highlight the negative and not the positive. And I'm going to ignore Uncle Howdy. What I really want to talk about is the perspective of um, at Wallflower Perry, who uh, made that post and host TWC, which is the wrestling club is a wrestling club based out of New York City uh, where kids get to go and like watch wrestling and they you know I'm I'm not super familiar with it. I know I've seen uh, some of the videos online of them like watching and reacting to wrestling matches. But like that's just such a fucking awesome thing to be doing and to be representing and you know uh, again that's why WWE does things the way they do and Yes, having three black women str uh, staying strong at the end of the show that you can point and say, well, oh, well, they just, you know, again, even that is so recidivist and stupid because, uh, you know, you're acting like black culture is one culture when it's like you're talking about like lots of different cultures. So, again, I'm not going to get into the whole fucking debate. It's stupid anyways. Um, but I just wanted to really shout out again at Wallflower Perry. Uh, you probably are following them already if you're following me, but if not, make sure you go drop them a follow because uh, they're pretty fucking awesome. And last thing uh, today, again, I said I was keeping it really short um, today, so probably going to be even sub 30 minutes, so you'll be able to get in and out of today's episode. And again, just make sure that you please subscribe, uh, 
you know, hit that bell, do all the algorithm stupid shit, because next week we're going live, 4 to 5, baby, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live uh, with a couple friends. Uh, we're going to be doing predictions and previews for WrestleMania 40. Um, but yeah, getting away from the WWE, wanted to talk about one of my absolute favorite superstars of all time, Brian Danielson, a.k.a. Daniel Bryan, a.k.a. the American Dragon. Um, man, his retirement tour, if you want to call it that, uh, well, he's called it that. So I guess uh, his retirement tour, though, has been phenomenal. And um, watching him just like live his best life right now and, you know, go to these different companies showing up in uh, CMLO uh, down in Mexico uh, and, you know, having uh, the huge tag match. And now he's going to get to face Blue Panther one on one and. Uh, if you're not familiar, because I was not, uh, Blue Panther is like a Lucha Libre legend, uh, still wrestling in his 60s. I think he's 63, uh, pulling moves that I couldn't do. So um, I'm really, you know, I'm just excited for Brian Danielson and seeing literally whatever he wants to do uh, with this uh, aspect of his career. And man. I will say, though, Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay, I don't even need a story for that one. I am fucking excited for that match. That's going to be phenomenal. Um, that is, like, one aspect of AEW that I do love. I love that they give us the dream matches, even if necess uh, it's not necessarily built up over, like, a year or whatever. It's like you don't have that luxury in this case. So just have the match. It's two amazing superstars. You don't really need that much backstory for a match like this for people to really get into it. Um, so, you know, that kind of uh, rematch, you know, again, I, I just, I love that aspect of AEW, but getting back to uh, Brian Danielson, um, basically uh, just wanted to show a little bit of appreciation because uh, you know, I know like millions and millions of fans out there. I'm going to really miss him when he is ultimately decides, uh, sorry, when he's ultimately gone and he decides to hang up his boots, but he's so underrated, honestly, on the mic, like I, and loves the business so much. I would love to see him come back, uh, in another, uh, aspect or role, especially like on commentary. I think Daniel, uh, Brian Danielson on commentary would be like fucking amazing for like a post career. Um, if you wanted to do that, uh, and he could do that in any company, honestly, whether you wanted to do it, uh, with continuing with AEW or in a certain regard, come back to WWE, um, you know, post wrestling career, like whatever, again, just whatever Brian Danielson wants to do, like I'm here for it, man. And I think, uh, all of us are. And uh, with that, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point and kind of search for material here. I'm just going to sign off. Uh, again, I super appreciate anyone out there watching. Um, please subscribe, super kick that bell. We're going to be going live 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next week, April 6th, Saturday, WrestleMania weekend. We're getting you ready for dinner and for WrestleMania night one with predictions and previews. And until then, I will catch you guys on the flip side. Of contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled a rise on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm ballistic, vicious, characteristics. I read the different potency, empathetic genes, yo. Ever the eat them seeds at a short and never speed. Some of the is like some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail below stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws. Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with that clothesline from hell like Bradshaw. I'm toxic like septic shock. A dying breed like anorexic dogs.